Let us pray. Giving God, you continually surprise us with your abundance and your generosity. As we come here this morning seeking to be fed spiritually, awaken in us once again the desire to feed others, both physical hunger and spiritual hunger. Help us to model the generosity and abundance that you have modeled for us. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Let's join together now as a congregation singing hymn number 358, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Hymn number 358. Let's stand together as we sing.
Well, good morning. I've seen y'all all week, haven't I? Was it a good week? So, the scripture for today that Mr. Doug is going to read in just a second, guess what story it is? Jesus feeds the 5,000. What story have we been learning about and singing about all week at Music Day Camp? The exact same one. Isn't that a fun coincidence? <laughs> you know, I wish I could say it was planned, but I promise you, it just happened that way. It's pretty great. So, I'm going to get y'all to help refresh the story for in everyone's mind. So, how many people were there? Over 5. Why do you say over 5,000? Because they counted 5,000 men, but he was probably also there. Women and children. So how many do you think were actually there? Over 7,000, 10,000? Probably not exactly, but it's a nice round number. So we got all these people, and they've been listening to Jesus all day. It's the end of the day, and what happens? Everyone starts getting a little what? A little hungry, maybe hangry. Yeah. And so the disciples go to Jesus and say, Jesus, look, these people are starting to get hungry. We need food. And what does Jesus tell them to do? Why don't you feed them? Find them some food. So they go out to find some food. Because, I mean, is there a McDonald's around the street or Chick-fil-A? No. There, no, unfortunately not. <laughs> there was not a Burger King. And what do they come back with? What did, how, how much food did they come back with? Five pieces of bread and two fish. Is that enough to feed 5,000 plus? No. Is that enough to feed you by yourself? Yeah. yeah. That is enough to feed you? Would it feed 5,000 plus? Would it feed the number of people we have in here? No. Yes, yeah, it's not even 1,000 in here. So it definitely would not feed over 5,000. So, but what does Jesus do with it? He takes it, bread, he takes it, he breaks it, and they start passing it out. And what do they do? They keep passing it out, keep passing it out, keep passing it out. Oh, haven't we run out of bread at this point? No, we haven't run out of bread. Until what happens? Everyone eats, has more than enough, and they have 12 baskets of leftovers. All from five pieces of bread and two fish? Is that normal? That's more than the start. So that's a miracle, right? Do we know how it happened? Jesus. That's the, only, that's the best answer we came up with this week. Jesus is the only way we know that happened. But what does that tell us? It tells us that miracles do happen. He's the bread of life. It tells us that God can take a little bit and make it a lot and turn it into something awesome. He could. He may not choose to do that, but he could. So that's what, that's what we learned this week. That's what just, we wanted to share with you all what we learned this week about what God can do. So, and in just a little bit, after this, Mr. Doug's going to read the scripture, and then you're going to sing a song about the scripture, right? So, we're going to pause, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to listen to the scripture, okay? God, we thank you for the story of feeding the 5,000. We thank you that you can take our small gifts and turn them into something awesome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When Jesus heard what had happened... He withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. 
Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. These are the words of God for the people of God. we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for sending us people to serve, feed, clothe, and disciple in your name. At times we all believe that we do not have the time, money, or ability to help those you have sent us, but Lord, we know you will provide. You provide us with finances and resources. We thank you. Yet it is the act of serving you through serving others that gives our lives purpose and meaning. And for this, we are extremely grateful. Teach us to trust in your generosity. Teach us to love and support each other in the community beyond ourselves. You have given us much, Lord. We are thankful, but most of all, we are thankful for the gift of your Son who lived and taught among us. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, children, for your wonderful leadership in worship. Thank you, parents, for making it possible for the children to be here this week and to learn about God and to learn about ways in which they can lead in worship and lead in music. Now let's all stand together as we sing our offertory hymn number 476, I Need Thee Every Hour, hymn number 476.
us pray. Loving God, as you have used our children to show us this morning, all things are possible indeed through you who gives us strength, through you who shows us ways in which we can do the impossible and the unthinkable. We pray this morning that as we have this opportunity to bring your tithes and our offerings so that your work might be done here in Lumberton and around the world, we pray that we would give sacrificially. We pray that the gifts that we give would be beneficial to your kingdom's work. We pray that you would bless us as we give. Show us the ways in which you would have us to serve. And help us to love others as you have loved us. These things we pray in Christ. Amen. I want to offer my gratitude for this week as well for our children, for the energy with which they um, enjoyed the week, singing, doing missions, doing crafts, enjoying with one another, and also, and perhaps most especially, our leadership for Aaron and for all the volunteers who invest so much in Music Day Camp. It is truly one of the most important weeks of the year here at First Baptist. And I thank you so very much. Would you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit. Seize this moment to fill our hearts with your love. Our minds with your truth. Our spirits with your power. That we may be shaped in the image of Christ our Lord. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. There are moments in all of our lives when we simply need to get away. 
There are moments for all of us when we just need to put some distance between ourselves and our normal activities to renew, to refresh, to simply change the scenery just a bit. It's true for all of us. It doesn't matter who you are. There are moments in your life when you need to get away. And that's true even if you are the Son of Man, even if you are the Son of God. In our text today, from Matthew chapter 14, Jesus has just learned the very horrible news that his cousin, John the Baptist, his forerunner, his biggest champion, has been executed in a very ruthless way by Herod. Jesus needs some time away from everything, from all of his work, from his people, from even his disciples And so Matthew tells us that Jesus finds a little boat and starts to row on out into the distance just to put some space between him and his work for a little while. The therapist among us would say that Jesus needed to begin to process what had taken place. He needed to try and figure things out. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God, fully divine, but he is also the Son of Man, fully human And this had a tragic effect on Jesus. John was his kinsman. He was Jesus' champion. And John was such a good man. Had given himself to faithfully sharing the good news of the kingdom of God. John had never harmed anyone. He had done good for everyone. And now he's gone. Ruthlessly killed for no reason. You can call that processing. But what Jesus needs to do here is begin grieving. To weep and to mourn and to ask and even to yell the question, why? Why has this happened? And to do that, he needs some time away. So he gets out on that boat and and starts to to head out by himself where he can have a one-on-one with God. And where God hopefully will soothe some of his hurt and anger. But the people can see Jesus out there on the lake. They can see him and they know it's Jesus. And so Matthew tells us that a large crowd starts to follow Jesus along the shoreline, just trying to keep up with him so that when he does come on the shore, they will be right there and can ask of him. I I don't know if that's the way it works in your life. But there are times in my life when it seems as though life has just kind of taken all that I have to give. No more words, no more energy, just all of myself, that the life has just taken it from me. Yet there's one more person that comes along right about that time and says, I need something from you too. Or one other circumstance that needs my attention seems as though life kind of piles on at times when you feel like you have nothing left to give. When life has dealt you a crushing blow, life has a way of coming and saying, but I need one more little benefit from you. Well, for Jesus, that one more person who comes to him has at least 5,000 friends, all of whom who want something from Jesus as well. And they're waiting for him on the seashore. They can see Jesus, and Jesus, of course, can see them. It's hard not to notice a crowd of five to 10,000 people. He sees them, and he knows what they need. He knows what they need better than they do. And Matthew makes a, an astounding statement. He says, Jesus looked at them, even out of his own grief and of his own sorrow, and he has compassion for them. That Jesus could find the capacity to to feel for someone else in their own pain. People whose pain was not nearly as significant or as deep as Jesus's. But yet Jesus had compassion for them. So he comes to the shore and he starts to minister to the people. Matthew says he healed their diseases. And we can be sure he offered blessings and taught a few lessons along the way as he was working with that crowd of of 5,000 men, Matthew says. 
Now, Matthew of the four Gospels is the only one who tells us that there were women and children there, but we would have assumed that. All four Gospels tell this story. It is the only miracle story that all four Gospels tell, but Matthew is the only one to tell us that there were women and children too. And so there are perhaps as many as 10 to 15,000 people there, all wanting something from Jesus. We really don't know for sure exactly how many people were there, and I don't suppose it really matters, because once you get over a 1,000, another 1,000 or two is not going to make any difference. Come on, you're welcome. But what matters in this story, to the disciples at least, is that the, the hour is getting kind of late. Jesus, um, you, you've been out this for a while, and you've been talking amongst those folks and ministering to them, and you know, the disciples have caught up with Jesus as well, and, and they're looking at their watches, and, and they're thinking, Jesus, we probably need to move this thing along. You've been at this a while. You've got to be tired. We know you wanted to get away from everything, but it, the hour is late. The, the sun is about to set, and these folks, they're going to be getting hungry. I'm surprised no one has said anything about it yet. But Jesus, it might be a good idea if you wrap things up. You can get up as early as you want to tomorrow morning and you can get right back at it and you can teach and heal and bless as many people as your hearts desire. But let's, let's be mindful of the clock, Jesus. And let's wrap things up. They're going to be getting hungry, you know. Matthew doesn't say if the disciples were thinking back to their ancestor Moses. But they could have. You remember Moses once led a, a large group of people, a whole nation, out of Egyptian slavery. Moses led the Israelites out into a wilderness, a desolate place much like this. And there came a, a moment very quickly when that crowd got hungry and they all started looking at Moses and saying, What are you going to give us to eat? Why is it, Moses, that you have brought us out here to starve us to death instead of allowing us to die? as slaves in Egypt. They turn on Moses in an instant, it seems. And maybe the disciples are thinking that that could happen to us, Jesus, and we don't want that to happen. And, and really, the answer is so easy. Just send them home. Send them back to their own villages. And there they can get their own food. Logistically speaking, <clears throat> that wasn't a bad idea. The disciples, I think, are, are fairly well-intentioned, but they are incredibly short-sighted and show a, a real lack of understanding as to who this crowd of people is. For you could send these folks back to the villages. You could send them back hoping that they could find a market somewhere of some type to, to be able to buy some food but chances are very good that in a crowd of five to ten or maybe even more thousand than that, you've got some people out there who don't have a home to go to. You've got people in that crowd who, who don't have a roof over their head or any place to stay tonight. And for those who do have a roof over their head, there's a good many of those folks who have no food in their cabinets. So you're sending them back to their homes that are barren and empty. They have come to you for sustenance, for nourishment. And even if there are some who have homes, if there is a market somewhere that they're going to be able to buy food, well, chances are they, they don't have enough money to buy enough food for them and their friends and the others. You see, food insecurity, that's a term that we are using these days to talk about folks who don't have enough food. And not just in third world nations, there are food insecure individuals right here in Robinson County, in our own community. People who do not have not only enough food, but good nourishing food. It is a, a new term, but it is an ancient problem. Food insecurity was rampant in the first century Roman Empire as well. 
And you can see that evidenced in the amount of disease that is taking place. So many times we hear of Jesus healing someone who is crippled or giving sight to someone who is blind. But on other occasions, such as today, you hear Jesus walking among the people, healing their diseases. Diseases which were likely prompted by malnutrition or food insecurity. The disciples are well-intentioned. They have a good idea of sending the folks home. It seems reasonable and logical, but it's just not something that could actually happen. And I wonder what Jesus was thinking as he listened to their idea. Was he feeling their frustration? Was he feeling some sympathy for them? Was he proud that they were trying to do something good? I'm not sure what was stirring within Jesus's heart, but I know what Jesus said. He hears their suggestion of sending the folks away, and Jesus looks at them and says, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. You need to understand what's going on here, my friends. We don't have us a problem here. This isn't a challenge here. What we have is an opportunity here. Those folks don't need to go anywhere. You give them something to eat. If you like a good World War II movie, or a great World War II movie, or if you like a movie about humanity and how human beings respond to crises in different ways, then I encourage you to to go to the theater and find the movie Dunkirk. It's just recently been released. It's a, a fascinating movie about a tremendous moment in history. It's set in Dunkirk, France, on the beach as the Allied army was being evacuated from France in May and June of 1940. The story is that the Nazi army, the German army, had just about decimated the Allied army and the Allies were faced with the decision. We either surrender and lose the war right here and now or we retreat and try to get back to England. Well, Churchill and his generals chose the latter. They decided to try a retreat and to cross the English Channel in some way. And so they enlisted every ship, every person that they could possibly find to create this armada that would rescue the army. They were hoping to at least save 35,000 troops. But they were able to save 330,000 troops. In military history, that is known as one of the greatest miracles in all of warfare. But it also comes after a miserable defeat. And as Churchill and England gets all of their soldiers back into their own country, they are delighted that so many were saved, but they are also decimated that the war was nearly lost. Being the great leader that he was, Churchill gave a very rousing speech where he promised that England would continue to fight. And in perhaps the most well-known statement of his speech, he said, Wars are not won by evacuation. Wars are not won by evacuation. I wonder if Churchill was somehow channeling Jesus. Because wars are not won by evacuation, that sounds somewhat similar to they need not go away. The dynamics now are very different. The Allied army was facing a a great war machine coming their way, trying to destroy them. And Jesus and the disciples were facing a hungry mass of people that needed to be provided for. The circumstances are quite different, but the sentiment is identical. And the sentiment is that we don't defeat our enemies. We don't overcome our challenges by running away from them or by wishing that they would simply go away. But rather we face our challenges, we conquer our enemies, if you will, by facing them and heading and approaching them head on. Regardless if we feel like we are or if we have enough. 
Wars are not won by evacuation. They need not go away. It simply means we must face our challenges head on, no matter how much we think we lack. And friends, as I have observed the last two or three months here at First Baptist Church, I'm becoming more and more convinced that that is exactly what we have been doing. A couple of months ago, myself and some other leaders of our church sat down together and we took a little inventory of where we are, of where we are financially, of where we are in regard to our ministry. And we also looked at our challenges ahead of what we have that we are facing and what we want to accomplish and, and the work that is lying ahead of us. That looking ahead, that seemed to be this huge multitude of five to 10,000 people that need to be fed in some way. We, we kind of felt a bit like some of the disciples and thinking, my goodness, there are so many of them and we have so little. Yes, we have more than five loaves and two fish, but I'm not sure if we have enough. Don't know that we are enough to be able to meet the need. And as we talked about the challenge ahead of us and where we are as individuals and where we are as a church, I'll have to admit there's a part of me that thought, well, maybe we need to evacuate some things, evacuate some ministries, or perhaps even evacuate some people in some ways. Or maybe we could just pray that they would just all go away the way the disciples pray that the folks would go away. We thought about that. And it was tempting to think that the challenge or the way ahead was so much greater than what we have. But in our better moments, we thought, no, we need to pray. We need to remember that God is greater than any challenge that we have. And that God's people, when challenged and when aware, are resourceful and generous. And so just a couple of months ago, you'll remember that I came before you, I wrote you a letter, and I, I asked you to take a look at your own life and to consider where you are with God and your commitment to First Baptist Church. And we asked you to consider increasing your participation in the, God's work in this church in three ways. We asked you to pray more. We asked you to serve more, and we asked you to give financially more. We entitled this, I'm in. We started the summer with an I'm in emphasis, a stewardship emphasis, if you will. And in the history of stewardship campaigns and programs, I, I don't know of a one that really ever should start in the summer, but that's what we did. So we asked you to to make a, a statement saying that you are in what God is doing here in the life of our church. And we had a hundred people say, yes, I'm in. I'm in and I'm either going to pray more or serve more or give more or I'm going to do two of those or I'm going to do all three of those. Now, a hundred people may not sound like a whole lot, but Jesus fed this multitude with one person saying, I'm in. And so we have reason to be very excited. We have reason to celebrate the fact that a hundred folks have said, I'm in. And we need to celebrate that because wonderful things have taken place in the life of our church. Not just because you have said, I'm in, but because you are living your commitment. Of the three commitments that we've asked you to make, the hardest to measure is your prayers. But I can tell you without any doubt that I feel an increase in prayers for the life of this church. I can feel the Spirit growing within our church, and I am very thankful for that. And I also know that of all the programs that we've been able to do this summer, most especially this week with Music Day Camp, none of that would have been possible without you stepping up and saying, I will give a little more of my time and my energy and my talent. And so service has grown as well. Prayers have increased. Service has increased. But we're usually quite interested in the numbers, aren't we? 
It's all about the money quite often. That's a measure that we use to determine what we can do and, and all. We, we pay too much attention to the, the money, but, but fortunately, the money tells a good story too. In May of this year, <clears throat> our offerings for the month tallied $47,500. That's a lot of money. But that's about an average amount that we need for each month to be able to pay all of our bills, to compensate our employees. We need that much money at least every month. But June was rolling around. And as you may know, the summertime is not the the best time for giving in the life of the church. A lot of you folks like to go on vacation, and that's wonderful, but quite often when you go on vacation, you take your checkbooks with you. (laughs) But in June, we were anticipating a decrease from May, less than $47,500. But in the month of June, we received $55,000. Almost 9,000 more than we had received in May. I've never seen that happen in the life of the church, receiving more in June than in May. So we were very excited. We were pleased. We were, of course, cautiously optimistic. But then here comes July, and, you know, folks are on vacations and trips and all kinds of things going on, and we can anticipate a drop. It's going to decline. But hopefully the, the word is out there that we need your generosity. Well, this past Monday, we got the number that we were looking for, the total number for our giving in July of this year. And to say it surprised us is the understatement of the day. It wasn't a decrease. It was an increase. An increase of $20,000 from June. We received in July $75,000 in monthly offerings and tithes. You know, church, if y'all were ever an amen church, that would be a good time to say it. Amen. That is wonderful to see that increase. Now, we have a long way to go. We have a lot of challenges ahead of us. There are a lot of mouths that need to be fed, a lot of work that needs to be done in the life of our church. But you have said and you are proving that you are in. And I pray that you will stay in and that you will bring others into the kingdom of God and into the life of our church. But please, please see what is going on here. And understand the spiritual lesson of what is taking place. It is directly related to this story that we read today. For in this story, we don't have a miracle. But we have the beginning of an eternity of miracles. The feeding of the 5,000 is not a one and done miracle that Jesus performed to prove his divinity. Rather, it was a way of showing this is how we're going to do things. And this is how it's happening here at our church this summer. For Jesus is saying, this is how the kingdom works and grows. This is how we're going to change the world. By your giving what you have and my using it to share nourishment for everyone. This is Jesus saying, this is how we're going to grow the kingdom. And this is how we're going to feed people. This is how we're going to put food in their stomachs. And this is how we're going to put faith, hope, and love in their spirits. And let me give you two very quick examples of how this happened. It it was about three weeks ago on a Thursday that she called me. She saw in the newsletter that Community Cafe was coming up in just a couple of days. And she called and said... David, I was wondering, do you need any help with Community Cafe this Saturday? I said, my goodness, I sure do. Uh, we, we, we don't have a, a, a set plan quite yet. I, I think it's going to involve hot dogs, but 
I sure could use some help and I would love for you to come. She said, I would love to come and help out. I've done it before and I, I want to come and help. And we talked for a few more minutes. And by the end of the conversation, she had volunteered to cook the entire meal, to do everything. David, if you'll just get a few more people there, I'll bring all the food. And on Saturday morning at 9.30, she showed up with her five loaves. There might have been one, more, one or two more loaves. I'm not sure. But she had loaves of bread and enough spaghetti and green beans and desserts to feed a multitude. They need not go away, she said. They need to come. And they need to come and eat and to enjoy a feast. And they did. They came and they enjoyed. Two weeks ago, <clears throat> we noticed our enrollment for music day camp was not where we were accustomed to it being. The enrollment for music day camp has always been about 30 children. It's about what we have capacity to, to be able to hold. And this year, just a couple of weeks ago, we noticed we only had about 20 ch children signed up. And we were a little disappointed about that, but knew we had a couple of weeks to go and realizing that people are on vacations and so on like that. And, but Erin had the idea of advertising on Facebook. She put a little ad out on our Facebook page, and within just hours, a community children's leader called her and said, this music day camp, is that for anyone? And Erin said, yes. She said, well, I am a children's leader in a community here in Lumberton, and I have some children who would love to come. How many can I bring? And Erin said, well, we have openings for about 10. She said, I've got it. I can bring 10 children. Is that okay? And Aaron said, well, yes, of course it's okay. They talked about it a little bit more, the schedule, the plans, and so on. And then Aaron also mentioned the fact that there is a fee, that we do have to charge a fee for the program, expenses, and so on like that. And while I didn't hear the conversation, I, I realized that the lady said, well, that might be a little bit of a problem because... Some of these children don't have the means to be able to do that, but I imagine we can work it out. And Aaron said, I'm sure we can work it out. Aaron asked me about it and said, is it okay if we do this? I said, let me think about it. Yes, of course, it's fine. That night we had a deacons meeting and we shared with our deacons the fact that 10 children in our community wanted to come to music day camp but might need some assistance. Before Erin left that meeting tonight, she had money for scholarships promised for all ten of those children. And they were here. They were here because Erin and the church said they need not stay away because they can't pay a fee. They need to come. They need to come and sing. They need to come and hear about Jesus Christ. They need to come. And they came, and they sang, and they learned, and they laughed, and they played. They had the time of their lives, and the kingdom of God grew by leaps and bounds this week. They need not go away, Jesus said. You see, you have something. Each and every one of you, you have something within your hand and your heart. And if you'll give it to me, Jesus said. Everyone will be fed. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you are a God who works miracles. You're not a God who worked a miracle. You are a God who works miracles today through us, through your hands and feet, through each and every one of us, giving what you have given to us back to you so that you might use it to nourish our brothers and sisters, our neighbors all around us. Lord, help us to be good stewards of what we have by giving to you in the faith, in the confidence, in the joy of knowing that you will nourish 
and fill stomachs and hearts and minds and spirits. We pray this, O Lord, in gratitude for being filled by the grace of Jesus Christ ourselves. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 502, Be Thou My Vision. If you would respond to God's grace this day, then I invite you to come and to share your commitment. Let's stand together and sing.